Brick Horde. Well, chocolate chips can. Or at least they can be re glued. I think we can glue your pretzel once it's fired, too. Okay. So it goes for you three here, too. Get, put your food on your plate. Okay. Blade, put your food on your plate. Yeah. <clears throat> So blade loose here, Kay, once you got your food on your plate, if you want to dim the lights or something, that might help. Well, just because you, she can see the slide so well. Well, you're right. We can't, we can't really dim them. They're dim as it is because there's three of them that are out now. It's still snowing so gently. It's like December. No, these aren't vocab terms. Vocab terms, I'll just put on Schoology. Speaking about, this is some more history. So I don't take notes over this? So you do take notes over this. And there is a quiz on Friday over this, but it's not the typical. We do, by the way, we do only have one more of those. We only have one one more of vocab. How many vocab are there? Okay, I don't know. There's six total, so I think there's only one left. Uh, at any rate, so we did uh, uh, ancient pottery. And we did modern sculptors and modern potters. And uh, I think we might have done contemporary sculptors, but this is contemporary potters or, or ceramicists. They're not just doing any old sculpture. They're doing sculpture, but they're using, um, they're using ceramics or, or pottery to make these sculptures. A um, couple of these are going to sound familiar because couple of you reported on them. So I don't know if I have additional information on those. Uh, I think I have some different different pictures of them. But so you, important contemporary ceramicists is the title. Okay. And I'll go, I'll go back and I'm recording this on Zoom. So I'll, I'll post this too. Uh, so if you need to, if you don't get these or you go too fast for any of them. So here's Alan Rosenbaum. Uh, and he's an American, and uh, as far as I know, he's still alive. I guess what I noticed is I don't have dates on here for you. That's my mistake, not yours. Uh, he's retired. He uh, was an art professor at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. He's been exhibited nationally and even internationally uh, and represented in a lot of public collections, including the Smithsonian and the National Museum one, the Smithsonian National Museum of Art. Smithsonian Institution is a bunch of different museums. People think of it's just one, uh, the one that was in the, whatever that guy that did that movie, The Night at the Museum. Oh, well, that was the second one. The first one is a New York Museum of Natural History. Anywho, and here we do have Tori after all, and we'll leave Alan up here for a little bit for her to get some of this. You know, as usual, you don't have to have absolutely every single word, right? Maybe uh, abbreviate national with the, uh, NET and museum with MUS and American with AM, right? Uh, VA is the abbreviation for Virginia. Um, I don't know how you're going to abbreviate Commonwealth because it's such an unusual name for a university. Usually you get state, right? So, former tells you that he's retired. I would abbreviate professor with PROF. Uh, you know, you could say internationally exhibited. You don't necessarily have to have that whole sentence in there. So, at any rate, Alan Rosenbaum. And here's a nice picture of him. Oof, I. Mac and Blade are fast riders. Everybody else is still going. 
And if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna doodle, if you're gonna turn it into sketch noting, does he have a great face? What a fun! You could cartoon or characterize him. No, you can't. Too late. I moved on. I know. Big jerk. Here's a, a big long quote that he's got, and this quote, I think, along with looking at this example, um, kind of helps you understand what he does. And um, I'm trying to think, uh, looking at like looking at your houses. Uh, a couple of you got pretty small. Torres is kind of small. Sierra's is really involved and intricate for being as small as it is. But uh, at any rate, he's got this whole little world, right? So he's made these hands out of clay, which, by the way, if we have time, that's not the next thing, but it's a thing after the next thing. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, he doesn't just stop with having hands. He's got a whole little city, you know, and I've seen people that what they'll do is they'll do um, uh, a box as big as one of the bigger ones. I think Mackenzie made a pretty big one. And then they'll do the little birdhouses, gingerbread houses that kind of fit in them. And so maybe they're like the size of sugar or, or salt and pepper shakers. So, But they'll have this little village of six or eight little houses inside of another box. Now, I've seen that kind of a thing on Instagram and, and Pinterest. But this guy... I don't know. I don't even know the scale if those are life-size hands or what. But he's got a whole little city there. So anyway, rate, here's what he says. He says, through my work, I raise questions about the nature of human relationships, the need for security, our methods of communication, the search for identity, and the importance of community. That's a heck of a lot to try and accomplish with an artwork, right? You can see that with maybe with a mural. But with a little clay sculpture, whew, this guy's got some goals. And then I guess I made it bold so that if you don't want to write the whole quote down, at least you write the second part down because this really uh, nails what he's trying to do with his work. You, you, might, you might say that he's um, a surrealist because this is kind of what surrealist painters and photographers do. They want to challenge your assumptions and challenge your perceptions. And the way they do that is they take things that you're used to and they, they twist them and put them into impossible context, right? So here's the rest of his quote. He says, my work negotiates a balance between real and imaginary. That's, that's surrealism right there. You know, it's super real. Surrealism is because it's above and beyond what's real. Okay? Beyond our daily experiences and maybe even beyond our dreams. I, could you imagine your own artwork, whether it's a drawing or a painting or, or a sculpture or a tattoo, raising questions of the nature of human relationships, the, the need for security, methods of communication, the importance of both identity and community. That's a big lift. That's some deep, that's, that's uh, psychology. I don't know. I tried to bring up this one philosopher one time, which that's probably pretty dumb for eighth graders. But when I was teaching civics, there was this philosopher in the 1950s. Um, gosh, dang it, if I can remember his name. Um, naturally, I can see his face. I can see a cover of one of his books. But basically, um, he, he said that we've all got these two needs, and that is to be independent, but also to be part of something. And the Eastern philosophies, usually in Asia, it's collective. It's part of something. Whereas Western, especially in the United States, we have this myth of the cowboy and the rugged individual and, and self-reliance. And I don't need anybody. I'm going to go it alone. I'm rogue. And so we have the identity thing, but they have the community thing. And really, any human being really needs both of those. And I think that he's I think that he's trying to say that's what he wants his work to be about. So here's another guy. And by the, by the way, any of these guys, if you want to look them up on, on Google and see more about their work, I'm not making you do reports on them. But, you know, from here on out, a, a lot of you have already started doing this. You're getting more and more creative and a little more and more daring with different things that you're doing. 
Um, so I want to encourage you. I think seniors have what four weeks, and everybody else has either five or six. I can't keep it straight in my head. But needless to say, we're probably going to have one or two weeks where we're just glazing and not because it takes so long for stuff to dry before we can fire it. So I don't want to rush stuff and try and squeeze too much in. But uh, basically I have three things in, uh, three or four things that I usually do in my mind. Um, each of them could take about a week. But... The other thing, and, and some of you, especially like if you're coming in during your study hall or, or lunch or something, um, I think Jackson is probably on that, and Tori has been doing a little bit of that, uh, is kind of like free choice. Not only can it be practicing in the wheel, but it would be making smaller things. And part of me is tempted to introduce that the, the last thing I always do is, is – uh, I think the Japanese word for it is min, minje or menge. Um, it's it was a folk art kind of thing in the early 20th century in Japan, and basically what it means is um, both practical and artistic. So you can make some small things for yourself that aren't necessarily a big assignment, but they're practical. Like you can put your phone on it, or you could put. Um, a, a book on it or your change or your jewelry on it or ha uh, hair supplies or makeup supplies or, you, you know, whatever. It could be for the kitchen or for the bathroom or for your bedroom. It could be useful. But it also maybe looks like something or means something to you. So it's also kind of creative and it's sculptural. That's Minge or Minje. Um, at any rate, I think uh, Brian Hively really all of these artists kind of kind of can fit into some of this stuff. So uh, he's a professor at Miami International University, and he's got really abstract sculptures. Uh, they almost feel like candy in a way um, between the colors that he uses, the glazes, and you, you saw in there the word is surface or texture. And um, Lucy was really doing that with her food stuff, uh, like her dinosaur nuggets, you know, and I haven't shown you how to do that, but so again, that's great if you're coming up with these kind of ideas yourself. I really probably should, um, but we can go outside and get leaves or flowers or junk, you know, anything that is probably going to get incinerated or consumed by the fire. And if you have stuff at home, it could be fabric, it could be burlap, it could be yarn, um, but we can make really cool textures on the outside surfaces of your of your clay projects and uh, even if we leave them on instead of peeling them off and seeing what the texture looks like even if we leave them on in the kiln they're going to turn to ash and then you're going to have this funky bumpy or curvy or texture whatever at any rate uh, so he's got a lot of contrast is his big thing okay? contrast is a principle of design and You'll see what I mean when I show you some examples, but um, artificial and natural, right? The, these are basically artifice and natural are, are synonyms for synthetic and organic. But, you know, some people, uh, like on her boxes, Haley was doing so good, smoothing stuff out that it almost looked like machine made, right? And other people um, were doing stuff that, you know, it looks uh, looks almost like it's could fall over even though it's solid. Isn't that weird? Does it remind you of anything? Oh, yeah, maybe you're a little young. Yeah, I can see like a gecko, like what the the pet in um, Tangled, the, the Disney about Rapunzel. I go further back though. This shows how old I am. It reminds me of all the stuff from Beetlejuice. All the little monsters and worms and, and stuff in Beetlejuice. And, okay. Maybe one of the nightmares on Christmas. Same director. So here's what Brian, Brian uh, talks about his own work. He says, it's my hope 
that the viewer is going to re-examine the natural world around them, reconsidering the importance of the most obvious natural wonders, as well as what would seem to be the most insignificant. So yeah, it could be a lizard, it could be a bug, it could be a leaf on a tree, it could be some very kind of primitive, to, to me it seems more um, South American than either African or Asian, but I, I could be wrong, I haven't been all over the world. Unless you call, unless you call uh, Mexico and Canada, and I haven't been all that far into either of those. <laughs> but, you know, it's an, it's an abstract thing, it's a non-thing. But it does kind of remind you of a cute little critter. But maybe a not so cute little critter. Maybe a big old bug. But because it's exotic and it's got pretty colors. Okay. So maybe I'm boring you. I'm sorry to put you all to sleep. This guy is, this guy is a little more fun. I hope that you... And if you're going to do creative stuff, either the, the free time stuff and Minge, like I mentioned... Or um, the two or three, I don't know that we're going to have time to get through all four, but of the bigger assignments that I've got left. If you want to tweak them and do something in addition to or different than just the guidelines, I, this is the guy that I hope really inspires you. The hard thing is that it gets so, it can get so real. Uh, at any rate, so David Furman. And he teaches at uh, Pitzer College in Claremont, California. Don't ask me where Claremont is. I think it's in Northern California, by the Oregon border maybe. Um, he's older than his picture makes him look if he has been teaching there since 73, because I was three years old in 73. But so there's a tea kettle. But to make this tea kettle, it's a gourd and a spout is a carrot and the handle is a chili pepper and the top is a piece of corn. You know, so it's like a collage or a montage, like this surrealist assignment that I just had my eighth graders do. And I don't know, I'm the only one that really got it, I guess. Oh, one of them is starting to get there. So it's just like made out of fruit. But so I made my... my um, rhinoceros out of aircraft pieces so he's making a tea kettle but he's making his tea kettle out of different vegetables it's on the board it's not hung up and here he's got a couple of people on a bench or a, or, or a sofa or a couch but they're not people they're the little wooden and i have one or two but i never get them out because kids always make them do um obscene things and honestly, maybe it's because we have the internet and we have phones, but I don't, people were supposed to put these little wooden things in different poses and then use that and come up with the clothes or the muscles or the hair and the facial features on top of it. But, you know, you can just find photos of people that, and draw those instead of, asking people to model, let alone have a little mo wooden model. But anyway, so there's a couple of wooden artist models. Only he made them out of clay. Love it, right? It's, they call it drop dead realism, or um, you would say it's uncanny if, you, if it was a painting and you said the painting looked like a photograph. That's like what they do in surrealism. But I, you wouldn't want to drink your coffee if it had a pencil and eraser floating in it. Right? Have you ever been someplace, like a furniture store? I know um, Nebraska Furniture Mart used to have these kind of things. That They're like jokes or gimmicks. It looks like it's spilled, but you pick it up and it's not even a drink. It's actually a sculpture of a spilled drink. <laughs> right? Sometimes they do that with like chocolate milk or milkshake or coffee, but no, maybe they don't make those anymore. Anyway, so this is a guy that he is making that stuff. Can you believe that that eraser and the pencil on the saucer are ceramic? They're not wooden or rubber. I'm guessing that he probably does some additional painting and not just glazing. And probably to get the get the coffee 
uh, probably it the mug might be um, hollow, but there's a flat. But then on top of the flat that maybe he he glazed black or brown, he's got like glass, like marbles or glass beads. It's just buy it at a, a, a fabric place, not fabric place, a hobby place. And maybe they melted in the kiln. Or maybe he didn't use glass or glaze at all. Maybe he used like a resin, which is like a plastic kind of thing. Then he did it after everything's been fired. Get whimsical, right? Whimsy. It means kind of cute or silly or funny, lighthearted. All right. Here is, she's more of a potter than a sculptress. Uh, and, but she's pretty serious. She's pretty hardcore. She's not an American. She's Irish. Uh, again, I wish I had like their birth dates, uh, but I'll bet that she's at least my age. Uh, Deidre McClellan. Deidre McClellan. Uh, Irish names, or well, obviously she's Irish and not Scottish, but Gaelic. Uh, abstract shapes, and I wish I had some examples on the board here. Um, but one of the things we did with sixth graders just recently is I talked to them about a painter named Waliski Kandinsky. And those of you that were in, oh no, you guys are went from drawing to, yeah, you went from drawing to ceramics. It's commercial art that went from painting to commercial art. Uh, anyway, um, he is an artist in the early part of the 20th century, and he was born in Russia. He was going to be a lawyer and maybe even teach, teach law as a professor, and then basically had this weird experience. They didn't understand it at the time. I'm surprised he didn't get burned at the stake because people thought he was crazy or something. Now, um, they understand there's a thing called synesthesia. And it's a neurological, I guess you call it condition as opposed to disorder. But your wires are crossed in your brain and your nervous system. So, like, the part of your brain that processes sound is processed by the part of your brain that processes images. Uh, a anyway, long story short, because I can go on forever about synesthesia, he's at uh, an opera, and he swears that he sees these freaky colors when people are singing, and uh, like drawings before his eyes, and nobody else in the audience is seeing this stuff. So he becomes a, a painter instead of a law professor, and he wants to work on making a visual language. So just like there's notes and chords and music, and music is, is an international language. You don't have to have lyrics. Universal. He wanted painting to be that way. Well, I, I don't know whether she's a synesthite. Or syn I think that's how they call that. Uh, but I think that that's kind of her goal too. What Deidre is trying to do with her, they, these aren't going to look like things. And they're not necessarily useful as vessels or pots. But what she is looking for is um, a universal language that what writers do with words and musicians do with notes, she wants to do with clay. Does that make any sense? I'm talking too long. And simple, clean, pretty, contemporary. But sure, maybe you could put flowers in it. Uh, you could put potpourri in it, you could maybe even drink out of it, I don't know, use it as a little uh, gravy boat, but, you know, it, it's really kind of meant to be felt and not explained, inexplicable, okay, she is going for visual language the same way that Waliski Kandinsky wanted to with paint, and here's a great quote for her, I know some of you are stellar A-plus students in all your other classes, and so you write every little thing down and good for you, even though I tell you you don't have to. I don't want you to get carpal tunnel. But I, I do think it would be cool if you would get parts of some of their quotes down. So she says, my best Irish rogue, everything I know is in my work. I don't always understand what I know. Deep, right? I know, it sounds philosophical or a little weird. 
it's it's definitely kind of an abstract quote. It's not. Here, here's what that means. You being art students are thinking abstract means weird or hard to understand. Well, you're half right there. <laughs> because from the teacher point of view, from education, um, when you were in elementary school and much of junior high, you were what we call a concrete thinker. You, you, can only, you think about what you see and feel and, and can touch and can manipulate. Okay? It is what it is. An abstract thinker, you're thinking in terms of principles and concepts, things that you, you can't necessarily recreate in front of you. You know, I don't know if that makes much sense or, or not, but ideas are fleeting and they're, sorry to use big $3 words, but ethereal. Okay? Concept, idea, principle, they're in your head. They're not, they're not something you can hold in your hand. So when her quote sounds kind of weird like that, she's doing some abstract thinking. Everything I know is in my work. I don't always understand what I know. It's a little like somebody saying, I know what I know, uh, and I don't know what I don't know. But the more I know, the more I know that I don't know. You know, it sounds confusing, it sounds like it's double talk, but it's not. It's, it, it is, I'm thinking that she herself might look at some of her, her pots like that and say, don't ask me, I don't get it either. <laughs> but it's still really pretty. <laughs> still really pretty cool. <clears throat> okay, yeah, Janice Mars Wunderlich. Wunderlich? Uh, so she's my age, and I think it's, I heard somebody saying this is one the one that I did. So I bet this is the one that her studio is off the side of her house, and and she was struggling with being a full time mom and a full time artist, and somehow balanced that kind of stuff. So yeah, mother of five, I I have three, and I wonder if that wasn't too much sometimes. Uh, my my wife. That's why I only had one brother. My wife had two brothers, so I think that's why we we went with three because that's what she knew. But I have friends that have five, and they were always teasing us. We you should go for a fourth, and they're like, no, you're no, no. <laughs> but always amazed by those families around here. Sometimes that'll have ten or thirteen. Like, what are you doing? Trying to field your own baseball team or something? Um, um, yeah, my you know my dad's dad, my grandfather was like the oldest of ten, so my dad's my dad would babysit his own uncle, right? Anyway, uh, anyway, so five is a lot. Uh, so she's got deeply personal stuff. It's narrative. Do you know what that word means? Has the English teacher talked to you about that yet? Okay, because it's not tough to figure out or understand. Like a narrator, what do, what do narrators do? They read you a story, right? So if you say, it doesn't matter if it's a song or a dance uh, or an artwork. If it's narrative, that means that you can come up with a story to go with it. Or, or maybe even the artist has a story but you have to try and interpret it. Okay, so Deidre's stuff, definitely not narrative. There's no story. It's just an object. Uh, some people's, it's descriptive, but not necessarily narrative. In other words, it looks like something, but there's not necessarily a story. She is definitely telling stories with her works. And maybe she um, captures the excitement, the, some of the images, some of the duties, nurturing. This one, even though it's got plastic wrapped around it and it's not finished, I can kind of tell, oh, there's some kind of mother-child thing. There's some kind of nurturing thing, like she's holding an infant or something. Right? So deeply personal, but narrative. Narrative tells a story. Have I been talking enough and it's been on there long enough that you about got it? I'm seeing two or three pens that are still going, but an awful lot that are not. Okay. So, or if you're not feeling great, I, like I said, I'm recording this, so I'll, I'll post it. 
so you can get it at your convenience. I know that you work a lot and you got other classes and it's senior year and we're about done here. But um, so here's that's funky because you could just have a little girl that's like crouched down and holding her toes with her hands, but it's sort of like it's made with two different clays. The the kind of bisque, kind of white stuff that we get, and the terracotta, the real red stuff. But then she's also um, done this. Uh, I don't know if I've mentioned it or talked about it, but I, I haven't done it very often, so I haven't necessarily had any of you experiment with it. It's not so much a, a glaze as it is a different color clay slip. And so you put the slip over the clay as if it's a glaze, but then you scrape away. I guess another way you can do it is like a resist. You can draw on there with wax, and and then when you fire it, the, the slip won't stick to where there's wax. So anyway, it looks like her bottom legs are painted. And anyway, it, so it just, it adds a, a dimension to it that it feels more multicultural. You know, and what that is, or I don't know what that, what that necessarily means, but here's her quote. Her quote is, mothering, nurturing, and protective instincts within me are so inherent that I tend to playfully bend human injury into animalistic imagery in my mind. So you ever call your, you ever babysit somebody or have like younger cousins or nieces and nephews or younger siblings and call them little, little monkeys or little squirrels or you know, little, yeah, little gremlins or my father-in-law because he's a farmer. I know this isn't very nice. It sounds like it would be judgmental or traumatic or something or racist or whatever but he's like oh they're like they're like little pigs they just find something they get root root rooting on it and then like little piglets but he was a pig farmer so what can i say i love her dog do you like this dog do you want to see a little i should have showed you this video when uh correct it's short, five minutes, but I, it's, she's, for a while, I think there's another artist after her. Yeah, I, worst case scenario, we, we finished tomorrow, but like I say, I don't think I have like three. I think I might have one. Oh, we need some sound. That's one of her daughters. Is I think. Get nice.
I want to see her working instead of just her kids talking. There's her photos. Let's see her actually work here. There's a bunny and a bird. Finally. In terms of my art, um, I think this that would be Anyway, I love this dog. It seems to be all kinds of little animals and story characters on top of the dog. Oh, she's an easy one, though. So, uh, Margaret Dodd is another another one that you have, um, one of you worked on. I think Zoe. Oh, is Zoe not here today? I think I counted her as here. Um, funk ceramics. It's passionate, it's sensuous, but it's quirky. Funk, not punk. Yes, this is the Australian lady, and she does, um, there's a couple of them. The other one, I think that she worked with him uh, because he knew her husband at some college. Who he, he does weird stuff, too, and he's considered funk ceramics. But Yeah. I gotta go back. I mean, most most important thing for me is that you, besides her name and she's Australian, is that you have funk. Okay, passionate doesn't necessarily mean sex. Sensual, kinda, kinda, meaning you know, free your senses. Um, but quirky is a little, a little weird. So, uh, and her work explores this notion of national identity via the symbol of this car. So before um, Mad Max, that uh, was an Australian film, and they all speak English, so I don't know why they dubbed it, um, because, uh, you know, you all know, what, what is his name? Anyway, um, Australia, this is like their Ford or Chevy, are these Holdens. Now, so uh, Americans, you know, they think of the 50s, they think of the 57 Chevy. You know, uh, maybe either a Camaro or a Mustang is, I don't know if we have a national car. We're probably more known for pickups. Um, but it's got lipstick on surfboards and a ram skull for a hood ornament. And may as well make sure. Yeah, I'm not, no, I'm not going to make you go through all of them. I just wanted to see if we're at 14. Yeah, there's only, there's only one more artist. So. Well, I don't know whether I will record that as well as this because, yeah. There's only one more artist, so I'm not gonna. Yeah. 